Uh, what got you there with got you got you? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there uh, with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Susan Kane is a former corporate lawyer and negotiations consultant and a self-described introvert. At least one third of people we know are introverts, notes Kane in her book, Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. Although our culture undervalues them dramatically, introverts have made some of the great contributions to society. Kane argues that we design our schools, workplaces, and religious institutions for extroverts, and that this bias creates a waste of talent, energy, and happiness. Based on intensive research in psychology and neurobiology and on prolific interviews, she also explains why introverts are capable of great love and great achievement, not in spite of their temperament, but because of it. In this interview, Susan dives deep into her creative process, transitioning from a lawyer to a full-time writer and what introverts can do to highlight their strengths. Hey guys, I want to tell you about the brand I'm obsessed with right now. And you guys know I'm pretty obsessive about the brands I work with, especially when it comes to athletic apparel. You guys need to check out 10,000. You need to head to 10,000.cc and you guys can enter code WGYT and you're going to receive 20%, yes, 20% off your entire order. Why do I love 10,000? 10,000 created the only training shorts you'll ever need. They do so by simplifying your options to deliver three premium shorts that perfectly cover all the ways you train. They have one built for versatility, another for durability, and one super lightweight, perfect for one of those runs or whatever else you do for fitness. No matter what you do, they have you covered. CrossFit, running, spin, yoga, lifting, or your weekend adventure, it doesn't matter what you do for fitness. They have a short for every way you train. They make it super simple too to find the right short. Just pick the short that's best for you, your lifestyle, personalize it with your individual needs with a custom liner and inseam options and start getting after it. Not sure if they have the right short? No need to worry, you guys. Make a return or exchange. They offer free shipping, free exchanges, and free returns on every order. Like I said, 10,000 is my favorite brand right now. I am wearing their apparel all the time when I'm working out. I can't recommend them enough. Head to 10,000.cc, enter code WGYT, and you've got 20% off your entire order. You guys know how much I love travel. So I think you're really going to like this next brand. That brand is Globekick. Head to globekick.com, check out what they've got going on, and you can also enter code WGYT to receive 10% off. Globekick makes your travel dreams a reality. They make it easy to discover, plan, and enjoy unforgettable adventures. And you're wondering what some of those adventures are? How about a yoga retreat in Italy? Cage diving with great whites in South Africa? Or their most recent trip was dog sledding and chasing the Northern Lights. Yes, they saw the Northern Lights. I think you guys would love checking them out. So head to globekick.com, enter code WGYT, and you've got 10% off. Susan, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? I'm great. Really nice to be here, Sean. Yeah, no, your your work's something that's impacted me and a lot of the people around me. So this is going to be a fun, fascinating conversation. But it's a little after 8 on a Tuesday morning. What's your typical morning look like? (laughs) <laughs> well, um, so pretty much every weekday morning, I drop my kids off at school, which I just did about eight minutes ago. And um, and then I go and I either play tennis or I do yoga. I do that almost every morning. Um, and then after that, I get to work. So how long have you been having a yoga practice or playing tennis? Um. Gosh, the yoga I actually just started about a year ago. I uh, I found a teacher who really broke down the basics. For, she, she, she had this class that she called Badass Beginners, which was for people who were in shape but had no idea how to do yoga. And she really broke it down so that you actually understood how to do everything correctly. And that really changed things for me. Um, so I've been, I've been really loving it ever since then. Um, and tennis... I started doing, I started, I picked it up again, having not played since I was a kid, um, a few years ago. And the minute I did, it just became this constant and reliable (laughs) source of joy. So I pretty much try to play anytime I can. You mentioned when you pick up a new practice, what is the beginning stages like for you? Do you come in with that beginner's mindset? Do you hire a coach? How do you approach those? Um... 
I don't really think about it formally like that. I, I, uh, I just kind of look for stuff that I really, really love to do. Um, and then, and then I just kind of try to do it as much as I can because I'm loving it. So why wouldn't I? Um, yeah. And I'll get lessons along the way. Or like I said, you know, with the yoga, for example, I didn't just want to show up at classes. I had tried doing that and found that it, it just felt like I'm not doing this correctly. And this will probably lead to injury or there's just less point in it. So I try to get the basic lessons that I need, I guess. Um, and then beyond that, I'm mostly focused on how much do I love it. But, but those examples, maybe that's not a full answer to your question because those examples are things that I'm not doing for the sake of, you know, becoming the number one most excellent tennis player or yoga practitioner. I'm just doing them because I love them. Um, whereas if it's something like, let's say writing or, you know, something where it's really going to be my thing that I'm trying to do at a, a, some sort of level of excellence. Um, I guess I'm a little more systematic about it then, you know, I'm just looking for everything I can to get better. And I take it really seriously. No, I think that's actually a, a wonderful answer because a lot of the listeners they'll have problems whenever they take on a new task or try to learn a new skill, they automatically think of it in that systematic approach where it's okay to just enjoy it for, for the sake of enjoying it. And you've got your yoga and tennis practice, and it seems like you've implemented those on a pretty consistent basis. Does that really help you build that positive momentum to start your day? Oh, gosh, yeah. I mean, I love starting it that way, you know, and I'm just so aware, especially with tennis, because you're running around so much. Um, you know, I just come out of there on a complete high <laughs> and I've noticed that like, you could tell me any kind of bad news during the half an hour, or hour after I played tennis and, and, and it'll just sort of roll off me, um, because the endorphins are so high. So yeah, I think it's an incredible way to start the day. And, and, you know, and I, I also just think you have to know yourself, you know, and for me, if I wait to do it and, uh, try to do it later, I might blow it off or procrastinate it. But if it's the first thing I'm doing, it'll it'll actually happen. So that's another reason I structure it that way. But, you know, every, everyone's different. No, that, that self-awareness there. So you have these endorphins kicking in after. I don't want to jump in too much into the weeds here, but what do you do immediately after that practice then? Oh, uh, well, okay. <laughs> so I'm kind of on a total maximum efficiency plan, as you probably noticed from trying to structure <laughs> this conversation, because I don't really have that much time, right? Because I drop my kids off at eight and they're home by three 30 and everything that I'm doing that day, like my work and exercise or whatever other errands I need to do, it all happens during those very few hours. So because of that, um, you know, like the minute I'm done with exercise, I, I literally like have my regular street clothes with me. Um, I'll change right away. I go run and get my latte and then I drive to whatever cafe or library that I'm working at that day. And then my head is down, you know, half an hour later. So being an introvert working in, in a public cafe doesn't distract you too much while doing your work. No, I actually love it. Um, and I've talked to other introverts about this, and I, I think it actually might be an introvert thing, which is if you're in that kind of a setting, you know, you get the best of being able to pick up the energy of all the people around you and just the buzz in the cafe. But I actually think it's easier for introverts than for extroverts to tune out all the surrounding noise and conversations and just go deep into your own zone. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, you're that phrase of alone together, which sometimes is used as a negative thing. You know, people will use that phrase sometimes um, to say, oh, um, you know, we're all with our heads down into our phones and tuning each other out. That can be a bad thing, but I'm using the phrase in a different way, which is to say, you know, you kind of have the, the joy of all these other people around you and picking up on, on that positive energy, but at the same time, the joy of being in your own head. When you're in your own head, so I love you, it. do you have headphones on? Are you listening to music during this time? Oh, well, that's a funny thing. You know, it depends on the cafe. So <laughs> if it's the perfect cafe, then then I'm listening to their music. You know, if they're playing good music and at the right decibel level, that's like the that's the best for me. Um, but 
it doesn't always work that way. You know, sometimes their music is loud or I don't like it. And then I'll put headphones on to get more into my own space. You mentioned the perfect cafe. What's your criteria for the perfect cafe? And then how do you select each uh, cafe you'll go to that day? Oh my gosh, there was once, <laughs> there, there once existed the absolute utopian nirvana of a cafe. Um, it was called Doma. It was in the West Village of Manhattan where I was living at the time. Um, and it was full of sunlight they played fantastic music um, and, and it was very pretty and charming. And it attra- this cafe attracted artists and writers and actors and professors from all over the city. And it also became such a thing that you know many tourists would show up there, like tourists with, with that kind of sensibility showed up there. Um, and it was just the most amazing spot for just for being or for meeting the other people who were there. It was kind of like the cheers of the cafe world, if you remember that TV show. Um, And tragically, it no longer exists, but I wrote a lot of my book, Quiet There. Um, And I I really think that I trained myself to love writing so much because I loved being at that cafe. And in a way, you know, having a book to write was an excuse to be hanging out there all the time. Um. And so I, uh, so I came to associate writing with this really positive feeling, um, so that nowadays I still would most, I, I still most like to write in a really pretty and inspiring setting. But it, even if I don't have the setting, I'm still really happy to write because the, the Pavlovian association has been encoded in my brain. I feel so bad. It's almost like Doma was this great lost love now. Did you have a, a cafe even yes. somewhat similar that you can get as much joy from? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I have been looking for one. You know, I'm like some tragic figure in a in an East European novel, you know, like going off and looking for that perfect love once again. Um, I haven't found it, but people tell me that Berlin, the city of Berlin, is kind of like the way New York used to be before the rents got too high, um, which is what killed off cafes like Doma. And uh, and so they say that Berlin is full of these cafes. Um, and I noticed when I was in Helsinki, I was rec- I, I do a lot of speaking around the, the country and the world. And, uh, and so I was speaking at the Nordic Business Forum in Helsinki. And there too, it was like every three doorsteps was an amazing cafe. So I think I just have to move. <laughs> at some point <laughs> that, that, that may solve the problem you, you mentioned yeah. you're speaking you're writing what do you most identify with right now um well really with those two things speaking and writing um you know and i ultimately expect that i will have a podcast like yours because i absolutely adore the medium of podcasts and i listen to them all the time um because of my maximum efficiency you know only working between these hours of, of nine and three thirty. I haven't had the time to do the podcast yet, but I'm, I'm working on another book right now. And my expectation is that once I finish writing that book, that my next big project will be launching a podcast. Fantastic. I know the listeners are going to be excited about that. So you're, you're currently a writer, but that's not, that's not how the career started. And I know a lot of the listeners are going to be interested about how you made this transition from a lawyer to a writer. Can, can you kind of talk about how that started and begun? Yeah, sure. Um, so I became a lawyer, I think, the way many people become a lawyer or other similar professions, which is, you know, you get out of college and maybe you have these aspirations of doing something creative or, or otherwise um, personally really fulfilling to you, but you don't really know if you can pull it off and you don't know how you're going to pay the bills and all those things. And so you do something more practical. And and I do have a really practical streak in me, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, so anyway, I went to law school and I, I, you know, and I had been an English major. I didn't know anything about law, didn't really belong there. Um, but in some weird way, uh, because I did, didn't really belong there, I actually enjoyed it more than most of my classmates. Um, because it felt for me, the whole thing was kind of like this unexpected trip that I was taking. 
um, you know, in some other world, some other country. So it was just really interesting. Um, and I, I really liked it. And I ended up practicing law for almost seven years. Well, I guess longer if you count my clerkship. So in some ways, almost 10 years. Um, and, and for the first few, you know, so at some point I was working at a Wall Street law firm that was for almost seven years. And, and for the first few years of, of that experience, I really loved it. Um, I just found it fascinating. And like, I was learning this whole world of Wall Street and finance that I'd had zero exposure to, zero interest in before. And it was kind of a kick to be able to do it. Um, but over time, I really started to feel like, oh my God, I'm, you know, I'm working 16 hours a day. Um, I don't really belong here. I felt I, I had imposter syndrome that whole time. And usually the narrative with imposter syndrome is that, you know, you're actually not an imposter and you just feel like you're one. But in my case, I, I actually was an imposter. <laughs> 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 like I really didn't belong there. And I didn't deep down understand what finance was all about, you know, and I was kind of like speaking this language without fully getting it on some level. That was how I felt. Um, but I was on partner track and working really hard, um, in that mindset. Um, and then, uh, one day towards the end of, I guess it was around my seventh year of doing this, um, a senior partner came into my office and told me that I wasn't going to be making partner. Um, and I still, I still don't know whether he was saying that I was never going to make partner or, um, just not at that moment, not, not that year. Um, but I just know that when it happened, I, I was simultaneously like, really upset and embarrassed and also liberated. <laughs> and so I literally that very day, that very afternoon, I left the firm, um, having no idea what I was going to do at that point. Um, but I took an extended leave of absence and I thought I'd probably travel around the world and just kind of kick back. Um, but what I found within 24 hours of that happening, I found myself sitting in my apartment and writing, um, and remembering that I had wanted to be a writer since I was four, which I had really completely forgotten, um, during all those years. And so I signed up for a class in creative nonfiction at NYU. Um, I was living in the village in Greenwich village at the time, right near NYU. Um, yeah. And I signed up for this class and went to the class and from the very first evening of that class, I just knew that was what I wanted to be doing. You know, it was like really strong and really clear and, and uh, haven't looked back ever since. We're going to get into your writing in a second, but was there some big dramatic guns blazing? I'm out of here, partner. <laughs> or, or did you kind of quietly walk away? Um, I guess it was halfway in between those. Um, I was lucky. I was lucky to work at a firm where there was a tradition of taking a quote leave of absence. Um, and a lot of people would take e these leaves, you know, and, and it, so it was started at my firm by an associate who was on partner track. Um, and he, he really wanted to be a partner, but he felt like he had never had a time to travel the world and, and, you know, just hang out. And so, so he, so the firm, he worked out an agreement with the firm that he would take this time and then come back and, and really get back on the track. Um, and that's exactly how it worked out for him. And to this day, you know, all these years later, he, he is a partner there. Um, but anyway, because he forged that track, there, there was this, this, uh, model for doing it. So I, so I wasn't like guns blazing. I'm out of here. F you. It wasn't anything like that. It was okay, more like, I got you. <laughs> um, yeah, like I'm going to take this leave of absence and, um, with the idea that I could come back after that. And I want to emphasize that point because in our culture, we have such a, a reverence for the guns blazing model, right? You know, there, there seems to be a kind of nobility in burning the bridges behind you because you're so, um, you're so, you're so sure of what you're, 
next path is going to be and the glory that awaits you around the next corner that you know you can afford to 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 burn those bridges and i think reality is not like that at all <laughs> at, not at all and you're so much better off not burning the bridges and and actually having a way back because you're much more likely to actually develop your creative dreams or projects or whatever you have you know whatever you're hoping will happen um if you don't have the stress of oh my gosh what am i going to do if this doesn't work because it may not work right um so in my case i knew i always could go back and i could have that salary if i needed it um and that gave me so much emotional freedom to really explore and do other things um because the stress wasn't there and, Susan, and and so uh, yeah no thank you so much just for bringing up the point about not burning the bridges and and continuing to have those relationships so sorry i interrupted you there no that's okay um i think it's huge and and it's not only about not burning the bridges it's also like okay i'm going to pursue this in my case it was a creative dream for someone else it might be some other dream but you have to know what am i going to do if this does not work out because it really might not work out um and that's okay and uh and and and, and in my case when i first started writing um i had zero expectation that it was going to work out as a career i truly i, I said to myself the goal is to publish something by the time you're 75. Um, and I never thought I'd make a living at it. I, I thought it was going to be a hobby and a hobby that I was going to make very central, but, um, but I, but, but I started setting up all these different freelance ways of making an income so that I wouldn't have to look at writing as my source of income. Cause I didn't want any of my emotional and financial pressure to be associated with this practice of writing that I loved so much. It almost ties back to your current yoga and tennis practice. It's something that brings you such great joy where you don't take that methodical business approach. I'm so fascinated you mentioned within 24 hours of leaving, you started to write. The six months prior to that, had you written a single word at all? Nope. Wow. Nope. I mean, if I look back at those years, I, I think there might have been one evening during those seven years that I was a Wall Street lawyer where I started like fussing around at the computer and writing something creatively, but that's it. And and even on that evening, I wasn't thinking, oh, I, I, this will be, you know, I will now become a writer. It was more like I was just playing around. So basically, no. So, so playing around, what were you actually writing? I mean, did you have a specific topic or were you just freehand journaling? Do you mean that that one night while I was a lawyer, or do you mean once I once I quit and and started writing for real? Could you hit on both? I'm interested. Just the first time you're starting to write, and then also the the coming months after that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that night of futzing around. Like, I I don't even I'm not even really sure exactly what I was doing. But but when I when I stopped practicing law and started writing, um. I really experimented pretty widely, you know, and it was a few years before I even thought about writing quiet. Um, so I started writing a memoir and I did one version in prose and one version in sonnets. Um, I wrote a play. I wrote, and I took a, a class in, uh, a, a class for playwrights, which was really interesting. Um, I did a bunch of essays. I started doing a novel, but that didn't really take for me. Um, so I did all this stuff that, and it, it's all still sitting in my hard drive and I never really tried to publish any of it. Um, and it wasn't until some years later that I got to quiet and I thought, okay, this one I'm going to try to publish. Was there one course, one class, a book you might have read at the time that you think was incredibly beneficial for you? Yeah. Um, so that class that I took at NYU that I was just telling you about was incredibly important. Um, it, 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 the teacher was great and the other students in the class, it, you know, it, it was a class that met, I think it was on Monday evenings. So it was all students who had other jobs, but really loved writing and we got along really well. And so even when the class was over, um, about three quarters of us stayed together in a writing group uh, that met for some years afterwards. And that was really helpful um, you know, for just encouraging each other to keep going. 
Um, one of those students, her name is Helen Wan, and she's now a novelist. And she, she was also a lawyer. And she, too, has quit her legal career and is now a novelist. Um, and, she, and Helen, because she was, a, she was a publishing lawyer, so she knew a bunch of literary agents. And when I, when I finally did come to the idea of writing the book that became quiet, and I described it to her, she told me that she knew the perfect agent for it. And she was right. And that agent is named Richard Pine. And he is my agent to this day. It's so funny, the number of lawyers who become writers. I was just talking to David Baldacci, uh, the famous writer, and he has a similar path as you. So it's it's interesting hearing about that. Yeah, I think it's because so many people who are verbally inclined, but don't really know what to do, um, become lawyers. So yeah, like, you know, at my law firm, there were, there were a lot of people who, who subscribe to The New Yorker and like to chat about it, for sure. <laughs> interesting, interesting. I mean, yeah. I, I feel like you're very good at, at overcoming certain challenges. And I know you have a personal story about a childhood experience of overcoming something that really impacted you. Do you know the story I'm talking about? No, I don't. Uh, with, tell me. It's around public speaking. and I know, Oh, that one. Yeah, yeah I would, sure. I think this would be a yeah. great um, start to really diving into introverts. So I would love if you could share that. Yeah, sure. Um, so... I have had, or used to have, let's say, um, a lifetime fear of public speaking. I didn't have it when I was a kid, actually. But when I hit middle school is when it happened. Um, and I think it was a combination of, you know, just sort of adolescent self-consciousness and being a constitutionally shy person. And I was at a new school and... Um, and uh, I, I think this was eighth grade and the teacher called, we, we were studying Macbeth um, and the teacher called me to the front of the room to Im- improvise a scene from Macbeth where I was supposed to play Lady Macbeth and my friend Rob was going to play Macbeth. And, and I absolutely froze. I couldn't say a word. Um, I couldn't, my, my mind went blank. I didn't even know what Macbeth was. I was just like standing up there at the front of the room, having no clue. Um, and I finally just sat back down and I just couldn't do it. And I felt completely humiliated. And ever since then, I had this crazy fear of public speaking. Um, you know, and when I say a, a lot of people are afraid of public speaking, mine was just really extreme where I, if I had to give a talk, I would always lose five pounds beforehand because I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. Um, and all the years I was a lawyer, of course I had to do some public speaking, but not actually that much. And I kind of just gritted my teeth through it. But when I was finally publishing quiet, I knew that I didn't want my fear of speaking to stand in the way of this project that meant the world to me. So I decided I had to get over it. Um, and first I tried, you know, I went to like a regular sort of talk therapist, which was completely useless because, and and by the way, I'm a huge believer in talk therapy, but not for the overcoming of a fear because for the overcoming of a fear, um, you know, sitting and talking about it and figuring out its sources is not really that helpful um, instead, what you need to do is exposure therapy, where you expose yourself to the thing you're afraid of, but you do it in very, very small steps. So I signed up for a class um, for people with a fear of public speaking. It's an amazing class. I think it's still run to this day. Uh, the guy's name is Charles DeCogno, who teaches it. It's in Manhattan, and it's called um, Speak Easy or Zen Speak. I think you can find it that way. Um, and so in this class, you know, he just kind of like exposes you little by little. So on the first day, you know, as I remember, all I had to do was stand up, say my name, sit back down and I'm done. Um, you know, and then you come back the next time and you do some, another exercise that's a little more challenging, but not that much. Um, and little by little by little, you really can extinguish a fear so that now I have a career as a public speaker. I mean, like I travel the world giving speeches, which if you had told me even 10 years ago that, that that would be my career, I would have thought that was insane. Um, so now I believe, like for anybody listening, whether your fear is public speaking or, or heights or, or public spaces or whatever it is, 
I'm telling you, it's possible to to extinguish it. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that story. I, I hope there are listeners right now who just heard that and they're dealing with something. And now this kind of is that spark to really help them overcome that. You mentioned the positive benefits of exposure therapy versus talk therapy. How did you even begin to think of trying exposure therapy? Was there someone else who told you the great benefits or was this your own research you did? That's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure how I got there. I do remember that while I was researching quiet, um, I started to read all the research about how all this works. And, you know, like if, if, if you think your listeners would be curious, basically what happens is if you, if you're exposed to a traumatic situation, which for me, that eighth grade classroom was, um, the experience gets encoded in your amygdala, which is the part of your brain that registers fearful and unpleasant things. Um, and, and what happens for the rest of your life after that, anytime you're in a similar situation, your amygdala is helpfully trying to get you the heck out of there. Um, so for me, anytime I was on a stage, my amygdala was saying, basically, you know, this happened to you once before in eighth grade. It did not go well, you know, so get off this stage right now. And it, it makes you really nervous and feel very, un- it feels very unpleasant to get you away. So that's really counterproductive. So, um, what I learned is that you need to kind of have more and more experiences that teach your prefrontal cortex, which is the kind of more thinking and deciding part of your brain to kind of talk the amygdala down from its position. Um, and I, I so I, I, I do remember I started to learn all about that and it just made perfect sense to me that, that this could work. Um, and, and, you know, as I just described it, like the fear is still there. Like your amygdala still has whatever associations it always had. It's just, you're sort of training it away. Um, and I say that because the word extinguishing, when you talk about extinguishing a fear, that's, that probably makes it sound a little bit too promising. It's like the fear is still there, but it becomes so minuscule and so manageable that it doesn't, it, it no longer dehorses you. It's no longer a problem. Um, so it's still there in some way, but, but it just doesn't matter anymore. I think that's such an important tip that the fear is still going to be there, which is learning how to control it. And it's, it's a much smaller part of you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know what to do with it when it shows up. Yeah, I'm so glad you you did so much research and so much work. Um, your your books I mentioned previously, a great help to me. Quiet: The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, and Quiet Power: The Secret Strengths of Introverts. How do you define what an introvert is? I mean, there's a lot of different definitions, and I think the the sort of all purpose one that you hear a lot is is really a good one. You know, the idea of it being where do you get your energy um, and so introverts can be very socially skilled, but still find that they become exhausted by or less interested in situations that call for, you know, huge socializing um, or just huge being out there in a big way. Um, and whereas extroverts find those situations really, uh, really energizing. Um, on a, excuse me, on a more neurobiological level, it's kind of about having different nervous systems where introverts have nervous systems that react more to stimulation of all kinds. So if you find yourself in a hyper stimulating place, like for me, airports, um, I don't get like nervous in airports, but I, I find I get extremely zoned out. Um, and I just, um, I, I actually noticed that cause, cause of the difference between my husband and me, like when we're in a, my husband's more extroverted and when we're in an airport, he kind of speeds up and I slow down. Um, and once he pointed that out, I, I noticed that I just feel this kind of like, I can't explain it, but like, there's something about an airport that makes me just like retire deep into my head. Um, and, and so because introverts have this, these nervous systems that react more to stimulation, we feel at our best when things are more mellow around us, whereas extroverts react less to stimulation so if they're in too quiet a setting, they start to feel listless and unhappy and they start craving to have more going on. Um, you know, and that's why sort of the stereotypical extrovert is always looking for the next party and the stereotypical introvert wants to go home. 
And it's not because they necessarily have any difference in how much they love people. It's because they have a difference in what kinds of settings they enjoy and how they like to see those people. I think that's such an important point because I think a lot of people will see an introvert and assume that they're incredibly shy or they're not interested in the people around them, but that just isn't the case many times. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, and people assume it's, it's some sort of synonym for misanthropy. And I think introverts themselves sometimes feel that way because it, it can become really hard to distinguish between your intense desire to leave the party and how you feel about the people who are at the party, you know, so, but it's, it's only once you start really examining it that you realize, oh, it's not, it's not the people, it's not any one of these individual people that are the problem. It is this situation that's the issue. Um, but there, what, one other thing I wanted to say in response to what you just said, um, so introversion and shyness, they are different. Shyness is more about the fear the quite intense fear of social judgment. Um, but I, I, I think of my work as having to do with shy people as well as introverts because shyness is probably even more misunderstood and more castigated in our culture than introversion is. And I think just as wrongly, um, cause it's, it's associated with all kinds of other traits like loyalty and conscientiousness that our society could use a whole lot more of. Um, and, and, and so shyness itself is an inherently painful emotion and experience. I don't think anybody wants to be more shy, but, but for those of us out there who know that we are shy and that's a lot of us, um, to understand that it's usually that the, that the core trait isn't shyness. The core trait is usually an underlying sensitivity that is con that's connected to a whole bunch of different things. And shyness is just one aspect of those things. Yeah, no, I appreciate you bringing that up and, and didn't want to gloss over shyness by any means. So, so thank you for bringing that up. You mentioned sure. people getting their energy from different spots. So for, for the listeners out there who are introverted and they know they have a big dinner party to go to, is, is there something they can do to kind of flip the switch to make sure they approach one of these environments with a more extroverted outlook? Um, well, first of all, I wouldn't think of it as uh, um, approaching it with a more extroverted outlook only because I think anytime you're telling yourself to be someone you're not, um, that's never setting you up emotionally as well as it could. So I would think of it more as, okay, how am I going to, you know, wh what's going to be my best experience at this dinner party? And, this is something that comes up actually a lot when I talk with people. So I can tell you all the different tips and tools that I've heard about along the way. Um, you know, some people have told me, well, I'm really most comfortable at a dinner party where it's organized around a specific topic. Um, or, or there's somebody there who's kind of guiding the conversation so that we're not making small talk. We're like, you know, discussing a meaty issue. So if you have any way of shaping the conversation, I think that can go a long way. Um, some people have told me that they, before an event like that, they, uh, they'll actually literally sit and make a list of topics that they think would be fun to talk about themselves, um, so that they can remember in the moment to introduce those topics. <laughs> you know, one guy who I know, he's actually, he's, he's one of the most social people in New York. Like if I told you his name, you would know it. Um, or not every, many people would know it. Um, and he told me that he, when he would host or go to dinner parties, he always had a little index card of these topics. And sometimes he would like rush off to the restroom because he couldn't remember what was on the index card. <laughs> he would, you know, whip it out and consult it. Um, and then another thing is, is really rationing your time. So I'm thinking of a, a third friend who I started to notice she, she pretty much accepts every social invitation. She always shows up um, and she always leaves early. And she doesn't make a big thing about leaving early. She just graciously thanks her host for inviting her and takes her leave. And I don't think anyone else notices. I only do because this is kind of my, my thing. <laughs> um, but it really works for her. And, and so the larger point is, you know, have your social outings in the, to the extent and within the framework that works for you. And, 
I think other people are just happy that you're there. But there are ways to show up for other people and also to do it on your own terms. Yeah, those are some great tips. I know a lot of the listeners, they, they send in some questions and, and they're structured in a work environment that might not be conducive to, to how they best work with open office spaces and things of that nature. Any actionable takeaways or things you've seen in the past that have helped those people in those environments? Well, I mean, for open office plans, yeah, that's sort of a universal thing that people always ask about. And I, I think the standard ones of, um, of uh, a lot of people wear headphones, and which is a way not only of tuning out the noise, but also as acting, acting as a signaling mechanism to other people that you're doing heads down work. Um, also, to the extent you can, bringing in personal effects from home, which will just make you feel like the space is a little bit more yours. Um, and even just strategic, uh, little props, like having a, a coat hanger next to your desk or something, any, anything that makes you feel a little bit more, um, blocked off so that you've got some sense of privacy. E- even if the privacy is illusory, your brain will react to just the presence of a coat hanger, um, in your peripheral vision by feeling that there's a little bit more privacy there. And finally, I would say, you know, don't be um, embarrassed to take the breaks that you need by taking a solo walk around the block or um, or if you can, if it works in your work, work environment, you know, darting out to work at a library or a coffee shop, if that works for you. Like w- whatever you need to do um, to get your work done and be more present to your colleagues when you actually do need to be with them Um to, to, to feel that it's okay to do that and not feel guilty about doing that can go a really long way. Yeah, no, feeling okay about it is so vital. I love the coat hanger technique. I've never heard that one before. So I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no. So I know you're, you're busy. You're working on a new book currently. Can you give the listeners a preview of what that work might be like? Yeah, sure. Um, and it's so early on in the process that it's a little hard to talk about, but, but, um, I mean, the book, I'll tell you the kind of catalyzing event for the book. And I'm going to tell you a story now about music, even though the book is not about music. Um, But all my life, I have been attracted to and and really like to listen to kind of bittersweet minor key music. Um, I mean, I listen to other stuff too, but a lot of minor key music. And when I was a, a law student, which tells you how long ago this was, um, you know, I was in my early twenties. I was listening to music like this one day in my dorm and some friends came to pick me up on the way to class. And this friend of mine, who's was kind of a, a, a lovable wise guy. Um, he said, why are you listening to this music to commit suicide to? And I thought it was funny at the time. And I laughed and we went to class and that was that. But for Years after, I mean, really ever since then, I have been puzzling over that comment and asking myself, why do I listen to this music? Um, what it, and because I actually find it to be incredibly uplifting. Like I don't find it sad. I find it really almost kind of transcendent. And I was trying to figure out what the heck that was. And I started to realize that tapping into the sorrows of the world, um, is kind of a great and unexpected superpower that we're not allowed to look at in this culture Um, because we live in in a culture that so relentlessly emphasizes happiness and positivity that you can't you can't admit the the side of yourself that feels sorrow and you certainly can't use sorrow as a bridge to connect to other people even though when you look at all our wisdom traditions, they all tell us that, you know, that, that sorrow is a, one of the hearts of human experience and that it is a kind of connection to the all and to each other. And so, um, the, the book is exploring all that. And, um, and as you can tell, I don't, I don't even have the soundbite version for it all yet, although I'm sure I'll develop it, but, um, but I'm looking at all these questions. 
Well, Susan, I'm certainly intrigued, excited about that. Uh, I'm looking forward to when that finally comes out, and I hope we get you back on uh, to talk about that. I, I know you've got your your yoga practice to get your day going, so you've got to get running <laughs> here, but I do appreciate the time. I know the listeners are going to walk away from this one with a lot of great takeaways. Where can they stay connected with you? Oh, sure. Um, well, the best thing would be to sign up for my newsletter, um, which you can do by going to my website, which is Quiet Revolution. So you go to quietrev.com and you would find a newsletter sign up there. Um, and I'm also on all the social media platforms. So Twitter, I'm at Susan Kane. Um, Facebook, if you put in author Susan Kane, you can find me. Um, I'm on LinkedIn and I have just started an Instagram account. So I'm there too now. Great. We're going to have all that linked up. But Susan Kane, I can't thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There? Thank you so much, Sean, for having me. It was great to talk to you. Hey, guys, I want to tell you about the brand I'm obsessed with right now. And you guys know I'm pretty obsessive about the brands I work with, especially when it comes to athletic apparel. You guys need to check out 10,000. You need to head to 10,000.cc and you guys can enter code WGYT and you're going to receive 20%, yes, 20% off your entire order. Why do I love 10,000? 10,000 created the only training shorts you'll ever need. They do so by simplifying your options to deliver three premium shorts that perfectly cover all the ways you train. They have one built for versatility, another for durability, and one super lightweight, perfect for one of those runs or whatever else you do for fitness. No matter what you do, they have you covered. CrossFit, running, spin, yoga, lifting, or your weekend adventure, it doesn't matter what you do for fitness. They have a short for every way you train. They make it super simple too to find the right short. Just pick the short that's best for you, your lifestyle, personalize it with your individual needs with a custom liner and inseam options and start getting after it. Not sure if they have the right short? No need to worry, you guys. Make a return or exchange. They offer free shipping, free exchanges, and free returns on every order. Like I said, 10,000 is my favorite brand right now. I am wearing their apparel all the time when I'm working out. I can't recommend them enough. Head to 10,000.cc, enter code WGYT, and you've got 20% off your entire order. You guys know how much I love travel. So I think you're really going to like this next brand. That brand is Globekick. Head to globekick.com, check out what they've got going on, and you can also enter code WGYT to receive 10% off. Globekick makes your travel dreams a reality. They make it easy to discover, plan, and enjoy unforgettable adventures. And you're wondering what some of those adventures are? How about a yoga retreat in Italy? Cage diving with great whites in South Africa? Or their most recent trip was dog sledding and chasing the northern lights. Yes, they saw the northern lights. I think you guys would love checking them out. So head to globekick.com, enter code WGYT, and you've got 10% off. What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with got you, got you? Thanks for listening to another episode of What Got You There. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and also share with your friends. Thanks so much. Looking forward to talking with you next time. If you want to stay up to date on all things I'm working on behind the scenes and everything we've got going on at What Got You There, head over to whatgotyouthere.com. You'll also be able to see more on podcast guests and what they're doing. Thanks to Justin Great for providing us the intro and outro song. If you like his music and want to find out more about what he's working on, head over to justingreat.com.